I'm going to keep saying, hello, is our microphone? Oh, is it on? It was because I got really close. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> Magic! <laughs> hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Kelly Writer's House, and welcome to this reading by members of the CLAW. I want to just clap now. <laughs> um, my name is Jessica Lowenthal. I'm the director of Kelly Writer's House, and, and I'm really happy that we could host this extraordinary showcase of Philadelphia fiction writers. Um, we timed this event with AWP, to be honest, so we could show off. Uh, I mean, Philadelphia is full of great writers, and this in particular, um, as a reading, is extraordinary. So I feel really, really lucky that we could do this. Um, tonight's event, I should say, is co-sponsored by our Bob Lucid Fund for Fiction. Um, Bob Lucid was um, one of the founders of Writer's House, somebody who had a vision for what a community space could look like on a college campus. It's not just for college students, it's inclusive of college students, but we hope you all come back here all the time because it is also for you. And that was part of Bob's vision. And it's also um, sponsored by Penn's Creative Writing Program. We came together and said, we need to do a really good reading. So yeah, thank you, <laughs> the Creative Writing Program. And we didn't, it didn't, we didn't have rain. We have enough seats for all of you. Um, people are wearing masks. It feels really good. Um, if anybody is nervous about being in a room this crowded, there are seats in the living room. And you can see there. And there is a split screen for ASL. If that's helpful for you, you can see this ASL also. Um, we have bathroom upstairs, bathroom in the back. Please feel free to use those. Um, I'm going to hand the mic over to uh, Carmen M Maria Machado, who MC, and I think most of you know who she is, but I'll just share that she's the author of the best-selling memoir, In the Dream House, um, the award-winning short story collection, Her Body and Other Parties, which we have for sale, by the way, along with some other books, one from each person, and this free broadside for a few people. Not quite enough for everybody, so sorry. <laughs> Um, and also the graphic novel, The Low, Low Weeds. Um, she's also, I just want to say, a generous community member, someone who helps bring people together. I think this was actually her dream team plan. Um, she's a great mentor for student writers. She's someone who really thinks about how that would work. And, and so if there's ever, we were talking about this earlier, a farm team for the CLAW. <laughs> I bet Carmen could put it together. <laughs> so please help me welcome Carmen. Am I, do I take the mask off? Is that, I actually you don't. Can take it okay, off. okay. Great, okay. I'm not, I'm gonna do it. All right, hi everybody, how are you? Oh, it's so good to see all of your beautiful shining faces here. Um, so the CLAW was a vision that some of us had many years ago. We really wanted to have to create a community of um, women and non-binary writers um, here in Philadelphia, um, not even to share work, but just to like sort of be in community with each other and just sort of be able to talk about our struggles, what was going on professionally. And it's been this like really rewarding part of my life here in Philadelphia. Um, and I'm really excited to bring um, a bunch of writers from the CLAW uh, together today to, to talk. Um, and to be reading for you all. So, um, our first reader is going to be is going to be <laughs> Piali Bhattacharya. Um, Piali is the editor of the NEA grant-winning anthology *Good Girls Marry Doctors: South Asian American Daughters on Obedience and Rebellion*. She is currently finishing her first novel and is writer in residence here at Penn. Um, could everyone give her a big round of applause, please? <laughs> Thank you so much uh, to Carmen for um, asking me to be here tonight, but also for asking me to be a part of the CLAW when I moved to Philly a couple of years ago. Um, I'm doubly excited to be here today as a CLAW person and also as somebody who teaches here at Penn. And I feel like I see some students here, and that's super exciting to see. So thank you all for being here. Um, 
So I wanted to read to you uh, from a novel I've been working on for a long time. Um, this is the opening scene of the book. And as we enter into the story, it's the autumn of 2009, and Dr. Prabir Mukherjee is worried. Um, he has a successful OBGYN practice in Westchester County, New York. Um, but it has recently taken a heart-wrenching hit. And though Prabir knows he should let the past go, he really can't. Um, he obsesses over the patient who nearly ruined his career until, in a fit of frustration with American medicine, he announces to his wife that he actually wants to open a restaurant. Um, the book goes on to two parallel storylines, one in which Prabir and his wife, who are documented Indian Hindu immigrants, do in fact open a restaurant in recession-era New York. And while they do that, they find they need to hire a chef and a kitchen staff and their chef happens to be an undocumented Bangladeshi Muslim man. In the second story, Prabir sort of examines what went wrong with his patient, and we learn that what happened there was a lawsuit, and he can't get over the fact that this patient sued him. Um, we also learn that she too is undocumented, she's an Ecuadorian woman. Essentially, I wanted to write about how America uses the term immigrant to lump everybody into one category. But in my experience, immigrant communities hate each other. <laughs> they are rarely in solidarity, and specifically, documented and undocumented immigrants tend to have absolutely no common ground. So to a person looking from the outside into this restaurant or into this doctor's office, all they'll see is a bunch of brown people. But inside that kitchen, inside that office, those people think of themselves as being in very separate camps. Um, so that's the book. And I wanted to read to you uh, one of the opening scenes because I wanted to begin the story by giving sort of an immediate feel for the fact that this is going to be a food book, um, but that the food was going to be approached both through the lens of a chef and also through the lens of a surgeon. Um, I wanted to see what happens when a surgeon brings all of his medical and technical expertise into the kitchen. Um, and so here's that scene. The book is called, so far at least, An Inventory of Errors, and this is from chapter one. Probir has never been afraid of flesh or fluid. Blood, vomit, urine, semen, bits of veins, bobs of fat, curious growths and niggling rashes, this is what his career has been made of. So when there's a headless, skinned goat lying across his kitchen table, he isn't phased. First, he must create his workspace. Nondita, he shouts to his wife upstairs. Where the bloody hell are the phone books we never use? Her voice descends from the attic laundry room. Well, if we never use them, then how should I know? Dash, hala, Probir mutters as he heads to the living room to get on all fours and look under the coffee table. Thank God he thought to change into clean scrubs and clogs for this job. The elastic waste is already coming in handy. He makes an educated guess, reaches an arm into the dust bunny depths. Bingo. He places thick stacks of phone books under each leg of the dining table. He gets an extra large cookie sheet out of the oven on which he lays out the carving knives, the saw, and rubber hammer he's fetched from the garage. Finally, he sets the tray on a hip height stool next to him. There, a makeshift operating room. This morning, when he called Nabil's cell phone, the butcher, for the first time in 20 years, asked him to confirm twice. A full goat, right? The whole animal? You want the neck still on? The latter answer was no, but there were no questions after that. Nabil knows better than to cut the pieces for Probir. Double parked in Jackson Heights this afternoon, it took the two of them plus one of Nabil's other guys to get the thing into the car, and it barely fit, even with the back seats crouched all the way down. On the ride home, Probir threw glances over his shoulder at his new friend whenever he could. Doing okay back there, buddy? He asked occasionally. And by the time he pulled into the driveway, he was soaking in med school memories. Those images have floated through the afternoon with him as if he's been riding the carousel of a slide projector, and now, 78 pounds of meat and muscle splayed in front of him, Broby doesn't have to think about where to start carving, doesn't have to create a game plan. He only has to pause for a moment, find the correct slide, and return in his mind to the Bidyasagar Medical College Anatomy Lab. Papery skin and leathery organs, the flows of the cuts are ingrained in his fingers. Before he reaches for a scalpel, Broby lays his hand over the rose burgundy torso in a moment of respect. 
This creature has been a corpse for several days, its earthly form preserved perfectly in the butcher's freezer. It's still cold to Brobi's touch, but it's not icy. There is just the right amount of putty-like give, just the faintest fingerprint retained when he thumbs the belly, which he does now, letting the ridges of his skin melt into the cadaver. Thank you, he thinks, and then picks up the smallest carving knife. The first agenda item is the most sacred and also the most intoxicating. Brovi must make a tiny incision at the sternum, pry the heart girth apart just a touch, just enough to let his knuckles through, and then find the indentation between the fifth and sixth rib bones. Palming the blade, he'll slide a finger along that rim, following it to its base at the spine. Then, pulling the knife back into his grip, he'll cut a clean line up that same smooth edge, which, when done on both sides, will allow the shoulders to fall away from the body. It isn't a complicated task, but it's a solemn one. It is no small thing to request a chest cavity to unfasten its latches, to expose its most occult mysteries. When Probeer is ready, he pushes the steel into the translucent tissue, and the meat against the razor strains, but it doesn't fight him. He's in. This wild thing has admitted him entry into its innermost sanctum, and the thrill of it sends a chill through Probeer's own chest. As he guides his right hand into the consecrated hollow, he can feel the ghosts of anatomy's past. Here lay the stomach, the intestines, the liver, here the kidney, and here the ureters, and here, ultimately here, here sat the heart, king of organs, lord of the body, the four chambers pulsed inside their private apartment. Here stands the throne of a fallen monarch, and in this moment, Brobeer is not in Westchester County, and he is not in the Bidyasagar Ana Anatomy Lab. He is only inside this instant, only inside the sorcery of the circle that allows him to sustain his own body with the body of another, and it is a miracle. Now Brobeer is locked in a waltz with the animal. One, two, three. One, two, three. Cannon bone. Vertebra. Shoulder point. Elbow joint. Nundita is saying something upstairs, but he can't hear her. His mind is filled with the music of the anatomy. His hands drift over the body as if to conduct the symphony of the dissection. Wind, strings, bass. Breath, ligament, trunk. Now the legs, now the abdomen. Pluck each rib like the string of a harp and move on to a flamboyant violin bow at the sternum. No more tentative snips. It's time to throw open the chest cavity and let it bloom fuller, rounder, the sound of it thundering, willing finally to give up its secrets. Glide over the ribs, legato, and then quick to the back, eighth notes for the meaty muscle around the spine. Staccato slices into the erector spinae so that a hulk of flesh remains on each single tip. And then, just as the slick paced crescendo reaches its peak, remember what both music and medicine preach. Remember that what has begun must end. Remember that the end must be as elegant as the beginning. Remember that beauty is preserved only when wonder and whimsy thrive. So remember, never touch the blade to the bone. Thank you. Our next reader is Ariel Zagato Dixon. Um, Ariel was born and raised in Trenton, New Jersey. Her de yeah, Trenton. Her debut novel, Don't Say We Didn't Warn You, was released in February 2022, very recently, by Random House. Her work has appeared in the Kenyan Review, Oh, the Oprah Magazine, Mississippi Review, and elsewhere, and she lives in Philadelphia. Thanks so much for being here, for having me. Uh, I'm a relatively new member of the CLAW on the junior varsity, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here, happy to be reading. Thanks for the Kelly Writers House for, for having us all. Uh, I'm gonna read a little bit from the book, an early chapter. 
a little bit about it. It's about uh, two sisters, an unnamed narrator, and her sister Fawn, who are sent as teenagers to a school for wayward teen girls, and then reunite as adults in New York, where they've kind of taken on a little bit of a grifter lifestyle in their own way. Um, so at this point in the book, it's an early chapter, the narrator is returning to her uh, hometown for the first time in a long while. All right. I discovered the love of my life after walking one night in a daze down Geronimo Street. Nothing was as I remembered. All the patchwork lots and cratered side streets and hungry storefronts of my childhood had been dusted off, reinvented for some new era. It was the earnest start of winter just after Thanksgiving, and I found myself on a b bustling thoroughfare aglow with the season. People were staying out later and drinking more. I had left the city on a lark. Earlier that night, on the train back to my apartment, I received an email from a spokesperson at the Veld Center. She, w she was writing to inform me that my sister had been released. It was possible she might try to get in touch with me, warm wishes for the holidays, and a happy new year. The subject line might have read, don't say we didn't warn you. I had forgotten Fawn's 18th birthday. She was a newly minted woman unto herself, and now she was free. It was six o'clock in the evening, and she might have been anywhere, hat in hand on my doorstep or watching from across the train car as my face turned to stone. When we lurched forward again, a kind of portal opened before me. Inside it, I saw my roommate toiling away at our outer borough roach palace, unwashed and energized by his next big project. I saw the scab of rust on the shower floor, the yellow light of the refrigerator suffused throughout the whole apartment, everything cast the color of drawn butter, everything sticky and past its prime. If my sister was waiting for me there, then all the more reason to do what I do best. I allowed myself to be shuttled an hour north. I got off in Deary and lingered there on the platform. A few miles ahead, the raised interstate cut through town. The elevated belt of highway was a streak of light, an eight-lane channel curving northeast, upstate and out of sight. There was the impulse to call someone, someone to come and get me and begin the next phase of my spontaneous evening, but there was no one, so I began to walk. The interstate extension was funded in the 80s back when Deary was going the way of other mill towns. My mother was living in New York then, unencumbered and splitting scant square footage with the aspiring artist types she claimed as friends. Together, they were always weighing the merits of buying land upstate. When the train broke down or pests procreated in the cupboards or the sewer line exploded in the alley, the dream of a kinder, simpler life was potent. It hardly mattered that logistics never materialized. No town was ever named precisely. My mother and her friends were content to refine their illusory lives, adding and subtracting amenities as they pleased, and it would have gone on in that half-baked way until a natural current lifted everyone apart into their separate, parallel lives. Only, my mother went and did it. She poured her fresh inheritance into a dilapidated three-story warehouse on the edge of Deary's industrial downtown on our Geronimo Street. She and her chosen brood would mastermind a mini-utopia just to train right away from the heart of things. Art would become their lives, and their lives would become art. It was a dream they could share. Of course, no one followed. Her friends caravan to unload her earthly possessions and admire the massive structure she'd acquired. So much potential, they marveled, and went back to their lives. It began to snow. The wind was hurtling in all directions, flakes vibrating and suspended midair. I thought of turning back for the train, but was suddenly sure that every passing car was driven by someone I once knew. I wondered what I looked like to them, hulking through half-frozen snow pile, rutted with gravel and petrified dog shit and trash. Every time a car caught me in its headlights, I tried to arrange my face into what I thought was a lucid expression, as if I might reassure passing drivers of my dignity. Like them, I too had a destination. When I reached the underbelly of the interstate, the traffic surged overhead in a wave that never crested. Eventually, my walk dead ended on Geronimo Street. Thirty-somethings flitted in and out of storefronts and bars, twinkling restaurants, all new additions. Our warehouse had been partitioned into high-end condos, and giant ten-foot letter forms were painted across the building's broad side, the Geronimo lofts. At the end of the street, before the avenue bears towards the wood and high-tension towers, I saw Rochelle for the first time. She was standing in Fawn's old bedroom. I bummed a cigarette off someone passing and tried to make it last while I watched Rochelle in the window. The curtains were pulled back, and she was standing close enough that her nose seemed to brush the glass. A candle burned. I saw its orange flicker wavering under her chin. She was looking out at something. Occasionally, she tilted her head as if puzzled by the view. Once I started living with Rochelle, I realized she did this sort of gazing all the time. She might stop short like someone on the street had called her name. 
As she gravitated toward the windows, I'd look on from wherever I was, trying to earn my keep by pulsing smoothies or fluffing pillows or otherwise showboating productivity. By evening, the loft's windows were translucent, and the lamplight doubled itself inside the dark sheet of glass. That was why Rochelle was posed there that first night and so many nights thereafter. She was taken in by her own reflection. I never asked her to keep me. Did I make sure we met the morning after, on the street where she lived, two hands reaching for the same blood orange at the corner of Geronimo and Vine? Yes. And did I, <laughs> and did I take her on a date the day after that? pepper her with questions designed to endear that flexed livelier lobes of my personality usually left on the blink. Yes, that's true. <laughs> but Rochelle was the one who invited me back to her place, and Rochelle didn't balk when I slept in the morning after. She encouraged me to run a bath, to pocket the spare keys on the hook by the door, to make myself at home while I was in town on business. Was I in town on business? <laughs> <laughs> I never travel for business. <laughs> that would require a real job, one with stakes high enough to strap employees into planes and blast them toward consequential meetings. I get by on remote freelance, drafting property descriptions that lure families on the hunt for dream homes. It doesn't pay well. Rochelle is more than a decade older and has entered the phase of wealth that's all about refinement and escalation. She pays someone to dress her and exercise her and decorate her life. I'm always discovering tasteful selections I've overlooked, like the strategically placed glass baubles purchased from museum catalogs, all amorphous, all weightless as tree ornaments. A week into living here, I woke up alone and noticed the oil painting above the bed for the first time. Stretched on thick, fragrant canvas, the composition is no more than a royal blue scuff on a sea of bone white. I stare at it every morning, believing I will soon feel differently, that one day I will possess an answer to its question. Despite our obvious differences in age and carriage, I know Rochelle is someone's total package. And not just someone, but someone in particular. Someone who is probably wondering where Rochelle is and why they haven't found her yet, <laughs> if she even exists. And here I am just keeping them apart. It's not as if I could have known she was single and looking, or that she would even be interested in another woman, that I might fall inside the strike zone of her personal predilections. I have since tried to interrogate myself for some ulterior motive, some specific scheme I was lusting to unleash on a heart unsuspecting, but I returned north to Deary for the same reasons Bird ventures south. I never imagined I would stay. Now, on weekend mornings, Rochelle and I jog the perimeter of town that borders the woods. Where there used to be a chain link fence, there is a paved pedestrian path crowded with baby buggies and zealous cyclists. Rochelle has shown me new ways to optimize my life. She orders vitamins online in bulk and has arranged an exacting regimen just for me. I take them every morning with coffee and she ruffles my hair when I do. If she ever wonders where I came from, how such a pliant partner arrived out of the blue and into her arms, she has yet to show it. And who's to say this new life can't be mine, that my future hasn't been waiting exactly where I left it. After all, I was the one who spotted Rochelle from the sidewalk that first night. I was the one who looked up and watched her move inside the yellow square of a midnight window watched her until that light went out. Now it's, a, it's as if I've stepped inside a giant set piece, wheeled before me, pre-assembled and perfectly lit, complete with a live-in girlfriend who subsidizes my days and asks no questions. Two months have congealed. Christmas came and went. There's been no word from my sister, no word from my surviving family. I should relish, relish the shape my life has taken. I should sleep soundly. I haven't told Rochelle I used to live here, and sometimes I let myself forget. Thanks. Okay, our, ne our next author is Stephanie Feldman. Stephanie is the author of the award-winning debut novel, The Angel of Losses, and co-editor of the multi-genre anthology, Who Will Speak for America. Her second novel, Saturnalia, will be published in October 2022. Everyone welcome Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. Thank you to the Kelly Writers House and all the members of the CLAW here and elsewhere. Um, I'm excited to read from the new book, Saturnalia. Um, it's set in a Philadelphia that is a little different from this one. It's facing um, greater and greater challenges from climate change. And it's also a Philadelphia that celebrates the winter solstice in a big festival that is organized by these elite social clubs. And um, I'm going to read from the beginning. Later on, there are going to be uh, monsters and 
alchemy. I have my, my new alchemy earrings. And um, really bad ex-boyfriends and things like that. Uh, uh, maybe you'll spot one in the beginning. Um, but this is the opening where we meet our narrator and, and begin the long night of the solstice. <clears throat> It's not the life I plan for, telling fortunes during the end of days, but clients are plentiful. They believe there's magic in my rare divination deck. The cards are bigger than my hands, gilt edged with an embossed pattern that emerges in the proper light like a layer of snowflakes. The drawings beneath are lush, peacocks and queens and church windows, all glowing like trapped candle flame. On the back of each card, an S extends into a wave of curls. S for the Saturn Club, Philadelphia's oldest social club, and more importantly, its most exclusive. Tomorrow, it will be three years since I quit. Technically, the deck is stolen. And in all that time, I've never read the cards for myself. But I woke up unsettled, and Max's surprise invitation has unsettled me further. I don't want to respond too quickly, too desperately, so I draw five cards and lay them on my worn bedspread. The Drowning Girl, the Leiden Jar, the Sphinx, the Horseman, and the Tree of Life. If these cards were for a client, I would reassure them that the drowning girl, blue-skinned, pearl-eyed, torso wrapped in eels, doesn't represent impending death, but a promise of transformation. I have no client to pander to, though, and I know the cards are a joke. Still, these days, I feel like I'm gasping for air, too. My rent is going up. My income remains erratic. I spent the summer house sitting at Society Hill, walking from town home to town home, confirming the windows were intact and the dehumidifiers were functioning. I religiously wore my second skin of poison, a slick of mosquito repellent, until summer, summer fever season died down and the rich came back, just in time before the tornado that wrecked the power grid and leveled Liberty Place. No more mirror tower in the skyline. Now the city's floating another bond and I'm nearly broke, dependent on what I can make telling fortunes. I can't imagine losing my place. I like living alone, and it's a luxurious amount of space, even if it's a deteriorating row home in a cancer cluster. I return to Max's message. Happy solstice, Nina. I have a job for you. Come over. It's the first I've heard from him since his bout with summer fever. I had offered in July to help, to bring soup, crushed ice, anything, but he declined. I was too embarrassed to press and risk showing that our friendship means so much to me, but not too embarrassed now to jump at his last minute call, even if it's just a gig for his vanity publishing company. Actually passing through your neighborhood later, I lie, can stop by. The drowning girl swims to the surface, roused by the dinging of her bank app, a little freelance cash, enough breath to get through the end of the year. Outside, Saturnalia candles glow through the morning mist, a flame in every row home window. The brick facades eventually give way at Broad Street to glass high rises and banks with ivory scroll work. Barricades line the curbs where spectators are already gathering along the parade route. Every year, the world gets a little worse and the winter solstice carnival gets a little longer. 10 a.m., the people are already out or still out if they started the celebration last night eating dumplings and rice balls, round for the cycle of the year, and drinking sweetened chicory and spiked cider at aluminum carts, the open container laws suspended for the day. A woman with a feather tiara and a man with a hook-nosed mask jump in front of me as I cross the street. Here we stand before your door, they chant, walking backwards, as we stood the year before. Give us whiskey, give us gin. Open the door, I answer the rhyme, and get the fuck out. <laughs> I'm not good at cursing in my stories. I don't know. Um, looks better on paper. They, uh, they laugh and let me pass. I continue on past the social clubs that founded the parade, the Pan, Baldor, and Saturn, the oldest of all, and now stand side by side on Broad Street within sight of the Ritz-Carlton and City Hall. The buildings are costumed too, robed in evergreen, like ancient lords at Yuletide. The real second half of the rhyme keeps echoing in my mind. Give us whiskey, give us gin, open the door, and let us in. I continue on to streets named for trees, to numbered streets, and back again, finally on to Delancey and some of the most expensive blocks in the city. 
It's segmented, coming to dead ends and then beginning again half a block north or half a block south. Delancey was built for horses and carriages and remains a tunnel of bright brick, painted shutters and coal doors, gleaming black window grills, and a mush of wet litter at the curb. Before 20th Street, I stop at the familiar gold plaque, Galanis Publishing, half art books, half vanity titles to pay for the art books. Before I can press the bell, the red door falls back and Max smiles. Nina, I'm glad you are nearby. Come in, come in. He's dressed in black, a fine sweater and thin black framed glasses. His hair, cut before it can curl, is black too, though the gray at his temples has expanded and there's a faint rash of pockmarks under his eyes, a remnant of the fever. He drinks coffee while I fumble with my buttons, my gloves. I'm glad you're better, I say. I was worried. No reason to worry, he says, taking my coat. I've just been slammed by production deadlines. He pauses. I'm sorry I haven't been in touch. My surprise must be evident. He turns his back to hang my coat on the polished tree. I want to reassure him, but instead I say, no, totally, it's fine. I've been busy too. I follow him through a second set of double doors and into the parlor on the left where the fireplace is blazing, a couple miles and a world away from my rental. My brother visited when I moved in three years ago and said it looked like a prison cell. Patchy linoleum below, bubbling plaster above, rot in the corners. Even so, I feel safe there. I can't lose my lease. I sit on the edge of the sofa. The polished table holds a second cup of coffee, real coffee, still steaming and apparently waiting for me. There are empty candle holders on the mantel and a small Christmas tree in the corner, bound in simple white lights. Max sits in the armchair in the opposite corner, where the light is dimmest. I wonder if he's self-conscious about his new scars. How's the fortune-telling fortune -telling business, he asks. He's the one who gave me the deck, months after I officially resigned the club and relinquished my own. Booming. I've held a string of jobs since the communications firm laid me off. Without the Saturn Club, I had no adv advocates when cutbacks arrived. But everything is temporary, grant-funded, part-time. My family thinks I'm an administrator for a charity helping kids in the fairgrounds, the tent city in the old Fairmount Park, refugees from droughts and failing energy grids. If they knew I was telling fortunes, like my grandmother once did, my father would weep, my brothers would laugh, my mother would flutter her eyelids and sigh bitterly. Makes sense, Max says. The worse things get, the more desperate everyone is. Do you tell your clients to be hopeful or to run for their lives? Depends on my mood. Anyway, I have a little time for the job. What's the deadline? It's not a proofreading job, he says. I need a package picked up. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so the next reader is me. I don't know how to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm the author of a bunch of books including In the Dream House, Her Body and Other Parties, and The Low, Low Woods. And I'm Carmen, sorry, <laughs> Carmen Machado. Okay, so I'm gonna be reading a story um, which I wrote for an anthology, a Shirley Jackson anthology. Uh, and the story is called A Hundred Miles and a Mile. When Lucy thinks back to her childhood, she knows she's getting close to the memory, not even just the memory, the words when her pulse picks up, a fat blue bottle fly bumping around a lampshade, urgent and lost. If she doesn't stop, it gets worse, a string being pulled away from a guitar's neck. Her blood feels alive, alien, spooked as horses. <clears throat> she knows if she looks in a mirror, she'd see her throat humming its own crazed tune. So she doesn't look, would you? It's strange, the knowing, not knowing. It twitches like something that won't die. When China shatters, when someone offers her milk, she feels like she's drifting away, like she'd simply disappear if not for the inconvenience of her limbs and her organs. She thought for sure these spells would leave her when childhood did, that she would outgrow them like she did night terrors and an allergy to cats. 
And it's true that they changed, became less about broken ceramics and dairy products and inexplicably quaint roadside restaurants and became odder, more diffuse, more of a mood than a fear, a sense of oncoming doom like the seconds before death by drowning. It got truly bad just before the wedding, well, the almost wedding, when she and Pete's mother visited the rental hall. The owner offered her tea, at which she accepted, as they walked discussing the space she sipped. When it was over, when she drained the final swallow, she saw a design of Cassiopeia in the bottom of the cup. Then a wave of nausea and panic, a darkening around the edge of her vision. Then a whisper dropped in her ear. Don't do it. Once they have trapped you. When the vignette faded, she asked the property manager if he had a telephone. That was how Pete's mother knew she was leaving Pete before Pete did. She thought Pete's mother would be angry, furious even. But when they got into the car, Pete's mother grabbed her hand and said, I wish I could have done the same, and then turned on the radio. They sang the whole way back, windows down. Months later, tangled up in Meredith, she considered that was it. She considered that that was it. She knew that on some level that to submit to Pete's bed, sweet and gentle of a man as he was, was unthinkable. But why that moment at the wedding hall? Why not when Pete kissed her for the first or fifth or fiftieth time? Shortly after, Lucy began seeing a psychotherapist, a shriveled little German woman named Dr. Kramer, who conducted her appointments from the top of her desk, cross-legged on a zabaton. She was very interested in the story, kept making Lucy return to it, examine it from new angles. Was it simply the reality of the wedding intruding on the fantasy? Or the knowledge of marriage as a yoke and a larger sense of what was being lost? Or was it the realization no amount of ceremony could make Pete to Lucy's liking, not in the necessary way? Or was it, she said this carefully, pointedly, the cup, with its scrolled handle and thin lip and delicately rendered constellation? You will never see it again. Don't do it. But that would be insane, Lucy thought, releasing her skirt from her white-knuckled grip, smoothing it over her knee. It would be insane if it was just the cup. A few weeks before her 19th birthday, Lucy took off with Meredith for a long weekend. They laughed as the city receded behind them and were in Niagara by sundown. This was three years after Liberace held the button to little Debbie Stone's nose to detonate the dynamite, and three years before little Roger Woodward survived a barrelless plunge over the falls. They rode the Maid of the Mist, ate too many hot dogs, made love in a motel lousy with honeymooners. On the way home, they stopped for lunch at a little inn somewhere near Syracuse. As soon as they crossed the threshold, Lucy realized something was wrong. Terrible. She collapsed into the chair and held the napkin against her cheeks. She traced the velvety contours of the fork at her place setting. Meredith was feeling tired and irritable and had no time for one of Lucy's moods. When the waitress came over to see if everything was all right, Lucy stared at her with such naked... Well, naked something, not desire, but an expression so open and vulnerable that Meredith stood up in exasperation. I'll wait in the car, she said. Lucy ate in a daze, refusing milk, of course. And after that, they drove home in total silence. They broke up just before they reached the city, and the next time Lucy saw Meredith, she was hanging off a blonde at the bag and looking like a million dollars. After that, Dr. Kramer asked Lucy if there was something special about the inn, the table setting, the waitress. Nothing, Lucy said. I mean, nothing I can put my finger on. A memory, maybe? Perhaps you went there, as a child. It's possible. We took trips all over, my mother and my father and brother and I. Dr. Kramer didn't say anything but watched Lucy over her bifocals. It wasn't that Lucy had a bad childhood. 
She knew people who did, who wore their past miseries like a winter coat, subtly altering their shape. But no, her parents were good people. She'd never been beaten or neglected. She never went hungry, always had shoes that fit. Her mother's death, well, she was technically an adult when that happened, wasn't she? And sometimes such things could not be helped. Her father was a content, if lonely, widower, her brother in love with his new wife. Dr. Cromer asked her to think back, to relax her mind, come to the moment cautiously, like you'd approach a dog that bites. Brave girl. Wise, brave girl. I wouldn't approach a dog that bites, Lucy said. Dr. Cromer held up her pen like a switchblade. Then how do you know it's a dog at all? A few days into her thirties, Lucy woke up in the middle of the night, already sobbing, <clears throat> as if she were rounding off a two-day post-heartbreak bender. She put on her mother's old mink and took a walk. It kept her warm, and every time the wind ruffled the fur, <clears throat> she thought about how it was unfair that inheritance, inheritances so often hinged on death. Why did people choose to wait? The sky was the cover, color of milky tea <clears throat> and scattered with a handful of stars. <clears throat> she walked past street funders, drunks, people pouring out of jazz clubs and bars over puddles and vomit and grates ejaculating steam. She walked until the dawn began to thin out the darkness, until waitresses were pouring coffee through the restaurant windows, until shopkeepers unfolded their sidewalk signs with a clatter and a sigh. Sometime after the sun was fully up, she found herself in front of a gimbal's. She hadn't been in a department store in years, and it was breathtaking, as if she'd entered some dusty, crowded market in Baghdad. She fiddled with some gloves, examined some scarves, she wandered into the perfume department and touched her fingers to the bottles and the stoppers. She uncapped a lipstick and twirled it free, then bent to a mirror and circled her mouth with wax. It was there that she spotted the child, across the room, rosy-cheeked, wrapped in a smart white coat. The child's mother was trying to decide on which watch on a watch for her husband. She was examining them closely, asking questions, holding them up to the light. She was distracted because she did not want to know the clerk to know how little she knew about them. It was very easy to lure the girl away. The police were called. They thought they were looking for a small child who had wandered from her mother, which is why they didn't notice Lucy at first, kneeling in the corner of the shoe section on the third floor, whispering something frantically to the girl. The girl was not squirming away. She was, in fact, listening with a solemnity and intent her own mother would not have recognized, and so she did not stand out. It was only when the manager recognized the girl in the white coat that they were separated. The girl waved goodbye to Lucy, and Lucy waved back. When they were reunited, the rescuing officer assured the mother that the eccentric woman did not appear to have been harming, her, harming the little girl in any way. <clears throat> she was merely speaking to her, telling her something. He almost ended with another word, telling her something urgent, but he stopped himself. He didn't know why. The mother crushed her daughter to her breast. She didn't notice the way his sentence trailed off. The police took Lucy to the station. She told them she simply needed the little girl to understand, to understand what they asked her, but she had fallen asleep in the chair. She stayed asleep for three days. When the little girl in the white coat became a woman, she would on occasion, think back to her own past and come across the memory of the department store for reasons she did not fully understand. Her mother, the watch, her own reflection in a glass case. Only when she looked at it sideways would she remember that it held something else entirely, a hulking, sorrowful creature, red-mouthed and sleek as an otter, extending her hand and whispering the thing she needed to hear. Thank you. Our next reader is Sarah Novich. Sarah is the author of Girl at War and America is Immigrants. Her second novel, True Biz, is out from Random House on April 5th. Everyone welcome Sarah. Hi. <laughs> 
Okay, talking. So yeah, True Bits, um, week and a half, it's happening. I'm gonna read from the first page so you don't need to know anything. Um, it's a deaf ass book. <laughs> February Waters was nine years old when she, in the middle of math class, in front of everyone, stabbed herself in the ear with a number two Ticonderoga. Their teacher had been chalking the 12 times tables up on the board, providing February a window in which to sharpen the pencil, the grinding drawing her classmates up from their daydreams, their eyes following her across the room toward the teacher's corner. February stepped unsteadily on the felted swivel chair, then planted herself in a wide stance on the desk and jammed the pencil deep into her left ear. The class let out a collective gasp, breaking their teacher from her blackboard reverie. She hoisted February, who was bleeding more than she'd expected, from the desk in a fireman's carry. February dripped a delicate trail of crimson all the way to the infirmary. After the nurse removed the graphite and determined the damage was superficial, she gauzed up the bleeding and took February across the hall to the principal's office, where the secretary produced a suspension form for, quote, violent and disorderly conduct unbecoming of a student. Then, once it was determined how exactly to contact her parents, she was sent home for the week. Back in 4B, February's classmates hailed her as a hero, having sacrificed her very blood to buy them 25 minutes of unsupervised bliss. <laughs> the school, on the other hand, deemed the incident a cry for help, given what the principal had taken to calling February's family circumstances. Really, February explained to her father when he came to get her, she wasn't upset at all. She was just tired of listening to the times tables, the buzz of the broken light above her desk, the screech of metal chairs against the floor. He didn't know what it was like having to hear things all the time, she told him. And with that, he couldn't argue. What had pushed February over, over the edge specifically was Danny Brown calling Sing Song from the row behind her. February is very hairy, and she eats the yellow snow. Only deaf people would name their daughter February, she'd thought then. Certain months were acceptable for use as girls' names. April, May, June, and her name was undoubtedly the result of some miscommunication of these guidelines. <laughs> but February's parents had always preferred winter, the silent splendor of snow clinging to the oaks, and in the deaf world of her childhood, beauty was taken in earnest. Her parents' friends weren't concerned with looking corny, and February had never seen it in of them say something sarcastic. It was a world she disliked leaving, especially for such hostile territory as the fourth grade. You can be deaf on the inside, her mother said that night when she tucked her in, but you can never do that again. Of course, things are different now, February thinks as she looks out over the quad at the River Valley School for the Deaf, squinting against the early sun. The internet has been world opening for deaf people and deaf culture has evolved to accommodate plenty of mainstream snark and slang. Plus, hearing people are naming their kids all sorts of weird, weird things now. Fruits and animals and cardinal directions. <laughs> the deaf world is no longer her safe haven, but her place of employment, and at the moment, she is screwed. As headmistress, she is supposed to have her finger on the pulse of the school. Instead, she has done the worst thing possible. She has lost other people's children. Two boys, Austin Workman and Elliot Quinn, a sophomore and a junior. Roommates. In front of Clerk Hall, police have parked a mobile surveillance unit from which they access Homeland Security cameras in Cincinnati and Columbus. They try to tap into the boys' GPS location, but this only leads them back to the dorms, where three phones are found in a neat stack beneath a common room table. The third phone prompts another round of bed checks, but everyone is accounted for. Elliot and Austin's parents arrive, yelling in a mix of languages at February, at the police, at one another. Superintendent Swall arrives, also yelling, demanding her office keys so he can go inside and write a statement. An emergency alert will be blasted out to every mobile phone in the Tri-County, and February will have to speak to the morning news. She ducks into a lower school bathroom, pins back her hair, and applies lipstick before a very short sink. She wonders if this shirt is okay, then admonishes herself for thinking about her outfit at a time like this. She returns to the quad and lingers near the police camper. She can already tell it's going to be an unseasonably warm day for her namesake month. No snow in sight, sunlight refracting off dewy grass. 
It's such a nice lawn. Meticulously kept, meticulously kept Eagleton bluegrass that looks vibrant, though it's not yet spring. A hardy species she chose personally because it would take the picnics and the Red Rover games in stride. She has always done her best to make things as pleasant for the students as she can. She tries to steal herself for the press, to choose words that might tamp down the frenzy, or at least not add any fuel. Lost is wrong. She shouldn't say that. She hasn't misplaced them. They escaped more like it, but that makes the school sound like prison. <laughs> Runaways is charged with a certain angst, suggests abuse. Eventually, she settles on gone missing, the passive obscuring responsibility. Superintendent Swall emerges and hands February the statement. Eight by tens of Elliot's and Austin school photos and a large mug. She stares at the pictures as she downs the coffee, both boys in button-ups, looking neat and agreeable, if not exactly smiling. Austin's eyes are the famous workman green, a light, almost spearmint color, and Elliot's are so dark they're almost black. She tries to meet his gaze instead of letting her own eyes drift down t to the scars on his cheek. For a moment, she's overwhelmed by the feeling that the boys are staring back, blinks hard to push the thought away. Then she hands the mug to Swall and steps up to the makeshift podium. When they go live, February holds up the photos first and then puts them down so she can sign and speak her statement simultaneously. A short physical description of each boy followed by the superintendent's message. The River Valley School for the Deaf is working round the clock with the Colson County Sheriff's Office and doing everything we can to bring our students back safely and as quickly as possible. If you see these children, please call the tip number on your screen. As she says the final line, her phone vibrates in her pocket. Distracted, she pauses for just a hair too long. The reporters leap in with their barrage of questions, largely unintelligible, except for the one closest to her who says, do you have any worries about the welfare of the boys, given the nature of their handicap? February bristles. Not the time for grandstanding, she knows, but she has to say something. I'm concerned for the students' welfare, she says, as I would be for any missing teenager. But if they can't hear, the students are intellectual equals to their hearing peers. Are they implanted? February is taken aback by the unabashed way he demands this information. I'm not authorized to divulge a minor's medical history on television, sir, she says. <laughs> the reporter reddens, but isn't ready to surrender the limelight. Any evidence of foul play? Do you anticipate charges of a criminal nature? He pushes the microphone against her chin and gives her a sympathetic look that rings false around the eyes. If you'll excuse me, I have to go speak with the police, she says. She steps away from the podium, but the reporter's face will not leave her. He's right. Elliot and Austin are not as safe as they would be if they were hearing, though not in the way the man had meant it. What if a patrolman finds them and shouts for them to stop, but they keep running? Or if they do need help, but have no way to call the police? What if everything ends well and they remain unscathed, but Child Protective Services uses the incident as an in to throw their weight around in the implant debate? She's read about it happening in other states. February has to bite her lip to cut the panic short. She's getting ahead of herself again. She checks her phone. The text was from Mel. You okay? She doesn't know how to respond. She shoves the phone back in her pocket and looks up to find another parent, Charlie Serrano's father, leaning against the police RV. Dr. Waters, he says, his voice much smaller than his frame suggests. Not now, she wants to scream. Yours is a mess for another day. But she holds it together, says instead, Mr. Serrano, we're in a bit of a situation. The campus is closed today, so you can take Charlie on home. He blanches. You mean she's not here? No, is everything okay? It's just, it looks like she snuck out last night and she's not with my ex, so I thought maybe. He sweeps his eyes across the quad. Holy shit, she says under her breath. Three cell phones. What, said Charlie's father. She sh he shifts his bulk against the vehicle, wrings his hands. I'm just going to, February points to the police insignia plastered above them. Give them a quick update. Wait, just a moment, sir. Really, she says. Then she rounds the camper and vomits her coffee onto its front tire. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, we have Asali Solomon. Um, Asali's latest novel, The Days of Af of Afrikeet, has been called a feat of engineering by the New York Times. She is also, yes, very exciting. Uh, she is also the author of Disgruntled and Get Down Stories. Everybody welcome Asali. Hi. 
Hi, everybody. Um, that was really good. Wasn't it? That was good, right? Um, so I'm having this experience where I have taken a lot of different allergy medications today. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm, I've never had, had that experience before. <laughs> Let alone, like, and then gave a reading? Like, anyway. Um, so... <laughs> This is the days of Afrikiti, and a lot of the novel actually takes place um, over the... Lizelle Belmont, who's the protagonist, is having this doomed dinner party. And so she spends about half of the night uh, having memories of another time. Um, and so this is one such memory. Um, this takes place at Bryn Mawr College in the 1990s. Oh, okay. <laughs> Get Brimar in the house. The good news about the final year of college was that there was a class about black women writers taught by a new black woman professor. When Lizelle arrived, she realized with a sinking feeling that the excitement was widespread. The room buzzed with too many bodies, too many girls flushed pink with excitement. Chairs wrapped and double wrapped the long table. Lizelle felt her shoulders gripping for the fight to stay in the class, which would likely prioritize English majors. Though she loved novels, she had not majored in literature. Her freshman writing seminar had been taught by a white man in his 70s who smelled like cigars and mulch and believed World War I was and would always be the most significant event in world history. He'd given Lizelle her first and only C. She landed in anthropology largely because the intro class, though also taught by an aged white man, had included mules and men. This class is called Writing Away From No Way. I don't even think we need to talk about why, but eventually we will, announced Professor Bruin, a tall, slender woman with sharp cheekbones and a fade haircut. She wore a collared white shirt, brown slacks, and lace-up Oxford shoes. After roll call, during which it was established that most people in the room were on the wait list, class began with an icebreaker. Everyone took turns saying their name and mentioning the last book they'd enjoyed. A shrill girl who waved her hand around obnoxiously back in freshman seminar claimed she'd read Das Kapital. <laughs> a student whom Lizelle knew to be a combination of punk and teacher's pet with her three face piercings and obscene t-shirt said she was like totally obsessed with Didion. <laughs> Lizelle panicked. She hadn't read anything all summer. She and Kit, her ex, had worked, fucked, and lain in front of the television in a cross-section of fans blowing hot air around. <laughs> Tropic of Cancer, blurted Lizelle. It was a book she knew nothing about. She had seen it, two copies actually side by side in the place where she and Kit had been house-sitting. Tittering erupted, and it struck Lizelle that she and the professor were the only two black women there. Didn't other black girls at Bryn Mawr want to read books by black women? As if on cue, the classroom door burst open. The arriving girl was, Lizelle could see without even turning her head, black and wearing something skimpy and bright yellow, all wrong for showing up late. Lizelle felt her cheeks warm as the girl clacked forward in what sounded like platform shoes. As the class continued to casually demonstrate their erudite and wide-ranging tastes, Lizelle began to feel she might very well hate, if not this professor, then her fawning white familiars. Though the names on the syllabus thrilled her, Ntozaki Shange, Audre Lorde, Octavia Butler, Angela Davis, Lucille Clifton, Jane Cortez, she reflected that on the first day of class it was permissible to get up and quietly leave. She could give her seat to the girl standing near the door in her ridiculous dress. Miss, said the professor, before you arrived, we were introducing ourselves and sharing the title of something we enjoyed reading recently. Selena Octave had recently enjoyed reading The Coldest Winter Ever by Sister Soldier. The class looked to the clearly bemused professor for guidance. Lizelle's mother, Verity, had hated that book, but it had made a strong impression on Lizelle, especially some parts. Lizelle looked at Selena, her short, ropey dreadlocks, lips like Lauren Hills. Remembering that the coldest winter ever had given Lizelle what Kit called a girl boner, she forgot to get up and leave the class. She couldn't stop staring at Selena. Lizelle had had some notable first encounters. When she met Manda, she had imagined them tangled up in each other. 
At the party where she met Kit, she'd felt a charge that could just as easily have been violent dislike. Between those years, the pull Lizelle felt to various girls had been primarily about their thereness. She wondered if this girl, Selena, was gay, feeling panic and dread at either possibility. After Professor Bruin dismissed the class, a throng of students moved toward her to make the case for what they needed to take it. Lizelle moved against the flow, instead heading towards Selena, so intently thinking of what she would say that she didn't see the monogram tote bag in her path. Though at one point she'd been falling forward, she somehow wound up on her back. Are you okay? Lizelle looked up into liquid black eyes, smoky with coal, wide with worry. The girl had magnificent eyebrows. Though the style at that time was thin little half moons, her thick, nearly neatly shaped ones shined with luster. Slender gold bracelets tinkled as she reached out and touched Lizelle on the shoulder. I'm fine, said Lizelle. Then a throbbing in her head made her lie back down. A phrase from Verity's favorite book by Toni Morrison popped into her head. A hot thing. The girl squatted, folding her impossibly long legs. Lizelle, right? Professor Bruin stood over the two of them. Maybe you should stop by the infirmary just to be sure. I think I heard your head hit the floor. To Selena, she said, you'll look after her, won't you? Am I in the class, Lizelle asked, but the throng of white girls had already closed around the professor again. <laughs> Can you stand? The girl asked as she helped Lizelle up. Considering it was the first day of classes, the waiting room at the infirmary was surprisingly full of the infirm. At least one girl was sobbing quietly. The wait was long enough for them to le learn that they were both from Philadelphia, for which reasons Lizelle never understood was not common among the black girls on campus. Lizelle hailed from West Philadelphia, Selena from farther west. They had gone to different academic magnet high schools. While making small talk, Lizelle made calculations. This girl was new to college. After she stopped running around with the ill-conceived crew she had picked up during freshman orientation, she would need actual friends. But was this the beginning of a friendship? She looked at Selena's lips, the small shapes of her collarbone, moist with sweat, and felt like a lesbian vampire. <laughs> also, also lightheaded. Maybe these were concussion symptoms. <laughs> Lizelle thought ruefully of Kit, the first girl to say, I love you. She had dutifully parried it back less than three months ago. Early in the summer, she had felt love, house sitting in a gorgeous downtown appointment apartment belonging to a gay couple that were family friends of Kit's parents. But deep into July, Lizelle had wondered aloud one too many times why people who could afford air conditioners didn't have them and, drunk <laughs> and drunkenly set off a three-hour argument by describing a cafe waitress as beguiling. It was <laughs> during that argument that Kit had prided out of Lizelle that she did not and could never love Kit. Or maybe anyone, really, she'd said, at which Kit had laughed maniacally and then hurled a bunch of words at Lizelle that stung damaged, user, social climber, empty hole where your heart should be. <laughs> Lizelle had waited until the last possible day to come back to campus, come back to campus from Verity's house, feeling both shame and paranoia about the whole thing. She pledged to stay away from girls and divert her, devote herself to her studies, her future, and becoming a better person. Now she was chatting up this freshman who was probably straight, even if their arms lightly rested against each other as they sat side by side in boxy wooden chairs. Kit's rage, her pronouncement, the vow to stay away from girls, the blazing sigh of Selena, she, blazing sight of Selena, she ran through cycles of these thoughts in the span of a few minutes. Then she screwed up her courage as if to jump into freezing water. She smiled. I can't believe your boyfriend didn't want to go to the same college to keep an eye on you. <laughs> Here, there was a pause during which she died while Selena, <laughs> while Selena busied herself untangling her thin bracelets. She finally looked up. I don't have a boyfriend, she said. Her eyes were sad. The effect as she smiled was of sunshine through rain, rainbows. What about your boyfriend? How does he deal with the distance? They looked at each other. Why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Kelly Writers House and Pun, for having us. 
Um, I think, yeah, there are some books for sale in the back, and I'm sure people will be happy to sign them. Um, thanks, y'all, for coming out, and have a good night. <laughs> Oh, yeah, sorry. There's a reception with wine and cheese. <laughs> Go get wine and cheese. <laughs>